And number two, you have to, outside of your job, build your skills in this world, otherwise you will be vulnerable. Period. Morning. Um, Really nice to meet you guys. I'd love to do as much Q&A as possible. I'll pick it up from that point. In 2009, uh, on the back of a lot of success early in my life, uh, especially by investing in Facebook and Twitter, it became very obvious to me that uh, the world was about to go through a substantial change and that this internet thing was far bigger than what I even thought as a kid and that we were just in the beginning, not the end. And I think sometimes, especially for you guys, like you know how timing is, right? You think it's over. Like It's like a band you like. You think it's over, but they didn't even start getting big even though you've been on for a year and a half. That's kind of how I thought about the internet as a whole. My father-in-law was uh, Jim Kiltz's right-hand marketing guy at Nabisco Craft and Gillette. And so at family functions and barbecues and random times, I would hear them talk about big brands and and they were winning. Like they were like considered like winning and like they were doing all the right things. Every company had turned around. Uh, And then something very interesting happened. I went on vacation with my wife and I, I don't really read a lot of books ever. Like I've read like nine in my life, but one of them was about the private equity firm 3G, which went on to buy Budweiser and Kraft and Heinz. And I was reading it and just kind of this series of like, you know, life is funny sometimes, it's about getting the pieces together at the right moment and having the time to think and really the only time I think is on this vacation. And so I'm kind of walking the beach and it kind of, like, kind of out of like a central casting movie, I was like, fuck. It just all clicked, which is, huh. If 3G is gonna win, and I think they are, and this was in 2009, for buying Burger King, firing everybody, maximizing profit, Wall Street's gonna like that. That made sense to me. If Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are gonna win, television's gonna get disrupted even more so, and I thought it was already dead by commercials standards. You know, and it's, as, you, as we're here this week, it's still very much on an emotional pedestal. Um, and so I basically started putting things together in my mind and saying, wow, private equity, these brands, And then I really thought Amazon was a very big company at the time and it's now been proven to be that. Um, And I was like, I think retail's in trouble. You know, my dad, uh, this business that we were referring to, my dad had a liquor store in New Jersey. I launched one of the first three e-commerce wine businesses in America. And just everything just kind of came together. My brother was graduating college. We wanted to start a business together. And then ESPN, a week later, asked me to come in and consult and they said, we'll give you $5,000 for an hour, and I was like, fuck. And I was, so it was all kind of coming together, and I was like, you know, there's, it might be time for me to leave Silicon Valley. I'd done the entrepreneur, entrepreneur, like real entrepreneur shit, not this new tech version, like being in a liquor store 15 hours a day for 10 years. I need to figure out this corporate America thing because it's big and it's wrong. And so knowing that I was a DNF student, I couldn't go, MBA it out or hire a couple people. I just don't learn that way. I was like, let me go eat shit for a decade. I'm gonna build an agency. I didn't even know what that meant. I called my company VaynerMedia. We only did creative for the first four years. Like, I didn't know that media and creative was separate. I knew, when I tell you I knew nothing, like, I never heard of WPP or David Ogilvy or any, I mean, I was 34 years old, started an agency, and never heard anything that, this, that you'll hear the whole day. Like, I didn't know what Can was, I didn't know what Ad Age was, I didn't know what Wyden and Kennedy was, I knew nothing. Here's what I knew. I knew that the end consumer wasn't being communicated to properly and that within the first six months and 10 or 15 meetings and a little bit of reading, I knew the whole thing was trading on the wrong things. Here's the amazing advantages when you don't come from the world. A Couple things. When you walk into the world and you find out that Nielsen ratings are super important to justify things, you do what a new person does like me who's an operator. You try to figure out how Nielsen ratings are being measured. What you realize very quickly is like, holy shit, this is mathematically correct but not practically correct. You can't have 2,000 boxes and people calling people and asking them if they watched Charlie Rose last night to figure out if like, it was absurd. And the absurdity continued every day. And so, a couple things that that I'd like to establish. Number one, I think creative is the variable of success for brands. 
So I'm not a mathematician or a quant guy or, you know, to me, just do it, where's the beef, priceless is the holy grail. When you produce something that gets everybody to know, that's how the human brain makes decisions. It's not because we cookie them and follow them around and buy. My problem though is I'm also unbelievably practical. My whole life has been, my work has to put food on the table, not win awards, not get headlines, not get me a promotion. So I've always cared if it works. There isn't a commercial today that works because nobody's watching television commercials. That's just the truth. And that's a truth we in the creative community have to start accepting because otherwise we're gonna have this rub and otherwise we're gonna continue to see what we're seeing which is the biggest brands in the world over the last seven years have declined massively. They're losing market share every day and we have to start having the proper conversation. And so to me, we're, we're in this amazing perfect time now where it's never been better to be a creative. You have unlimited flexibility. It's like being in production in Hollywood. It's great now. Everyone's winning because there's Hulu and Amazon Prime and Netflix and HBO and cable. There's so many places to sell your work. Hollywood's figured it out. And every, you know, they were shitting on Netflix five years ago. Now they're like kissing its face because it opened up everything. Um, I literally, I'd love for the front row to see this. I have huge goosebumps right now because as I'm saying it, I'm so passionate because I love this space because you know, the thing that sucks about being in something in 10 years, you meet people and you like them and then you just like the thing, right? I love this industry, I hate that it hasn't figured out that the second they put the romance of television away, we will all flourish. I don't know what to say. There is no Just Do It commercial over the last 10 years. There isn't a commercial that has driven business like they used to in the 70s and 80s and 90s because people don't watch them. And now on the flip side, Super Bowl is the best piece of advertising opportunity in the world. To me, the Super Bowl commercial is the number one place I would spend money on, a TV spot, but it's a singular unit. Literally the Oscars and the Tonys and the NFC Championship game and the world, all that's a garbage. People don't watch it. It's black and white. And so um, Hollywood, to their credit, quickly got off their bullshit and said fuck it because the economics were there. When Netflix started writing big checks, it was fine, right? The reason we haven't is that's not what happened. The reason it hasn't happened in our world is because the holding companies aren't incentivized to change. There's nothing else to say. That's just real life business. There's more margin in selling programmatic digital and selling television than any other category. Thus, that is the continued propaganda of our industry to the demise of creative work. The fact that you can make a 17 minute film on Facebook that if it was fucking awesome and you plan the media properly would really sell and make people excited is amazing. You know, the work that I'm most proud of at VaynerMedia are all long form videos. Facebook says don't do it because it doesn't work for their three second views. You know, the brands don't want us to do it. Nobody wants us to do it, but every time we do it, miraculously, the product sells at supermarkets and Walmarts and things of that nature. And that's even with the risk of the creative missing, right? And it still works because it's so being consumed in those environment. Yet, unfortunately, and I have a lot of empathy for this room, you don't grow up dreaming about writing one singular tweet like for Wendy's or Moon Pie that can change its business. It's just not what you're here for. We're not here in this sunny fucking place, right? For a, you know, the pedestal isn't about a one minute, 19 second video that's a pre-roll on YouTube before something else. It's just not what's on a pedestal and it's wrong. And it's wrong and I believe that. And so I'm very passionate to continue to communicate that. And, And what really bugs me the most is that When you think about audio, the rise of audio, sonic advertising, the fact that every brand now should have a jingle and a three second sound that we can associate with, the fact that you can make five minute videos, like the fact that you can make 11 videos for a brand instead of one is in theory amazing for creative. Like wouldn't you want to make 11 videos instead of one? Wouldn't you want to, look at this room. Nobody here looks the same. Shouldn't, if I'm Dove, make one for African American females, make one for white guys with blonde hair, make one for psychographic, demographic, financial interests, shouldn't I? The answer is yes. But the system forces us to do a subjective vanilla tagline that should work for everybody and then make one 30 fucking second video that should work for everyone, aka white people, and the shit doesn't hit. And everybody who's smart knows it or has looked up the biggest vulnerability, the, the, the reason if I'm talking right now you're like, huh, is you just haven't looked up. 
because you're in your shit and you should be, right? You're trying to win, you're trying to establish, I get it. Just haven't looked up. And the thing that, the reason I continue to only do this event at this place <laughs> is, is because I want you to win and you're not gonna play in the, my friends, your career will not play out based on the tone of this festival. You will not live during the television commercial on a pedestal era. That is not your career. And the quicker you figure that out, the better. You know, and so, you know, I, and, uh, and I think that this group is the most vulnerable because you're even in this room. If you're a young protege of this system, you're the most vulnerable because you're being seduced by it. Just makes sense. This is an honor to be here, right? So now you're, now you're in the fucking vortex. Now you want your face on a poster out there for a 30 second spot for Coca-Cola. And I think that's a big fucking mistake. And I know I'm right and deep down I know you know I'm right and I know you know it. And so now the question becomes what do you do about it? And so for me it's just a very common sense conversation. A Couple things I would highly recommend you do so it's actionable. Please do not disrespect social networks Every one of them, download and create for it. On the side, start a side hustle, sell peanut butter direct on Amazon and do all the creative on Instagram. Please learn the skills because you do not, you are the most vulnerable creative generation because when this actually fully hits tilt in the next five to seven years, you're gonna be deep in your career and you're gonna be judged for being part of this machine and you're not gonna get the best jobs because you're gonna be dissed for being a person of the print, of the outdoor, of the television, of the banner. You will. So you have to be very thoughtful. And by the way, I'm a historian. If you don't believe me, go read what happened to everybody who got killed during the transition of radio to television. Go read of all the executives, all the brands, all the creatives that lost in the late 40s through the early 60s when we had the rub between radio becoming television as the main platform. The internet is the main platform. Guys, I used to think that you would all, this town would wake up and stop doing commercials. I didn't realize that OTT was gonna come and there'd be no commercials. ABC, NBC, CBS, they're all dead. They're gone. Just a matter of time now. So they're not even gonna exist. It's not how OTTs are gonna play. So we're gonna be in a much more fun creative world, I think. You're gonna have to figure out how to integrate brands into creative or start original shows like it's all started, soap operas, right? Like who knows where this takes us, but please don't, when people become romantic of the past, we go into a bad place. We accept that socially. We haven't accepted it in the advertising industry. We put something on a pedestal that is completely irrelevant to the end consumer. I don't know what else to say. Like how, how is a te- television commercial penetrating your life? It's inconceivable and you're in the industry. You don't see them and you're in the industry. So how does a normal person see it? So I'm very passionate about this and I'm really passionate for you guys especially. And you have to, doesn't mean that the copywriting has never been more important. You have 5,000 places to put it in. I write different copy on Instagram than I do on Facebook than I do on Twitter. It's the same fucking audience but the platform's different so I know their psychology's different so I copyright different. Like the first three seconds of every video I think about differently. What's the platform? What's the context? Twitter only lets me go for 240 or 280. Instagram's a minute. Instagram's about to be longer. I'm already like spending an enormous amount of time of like what does long form Instagram mean? Because that's where the attention is. Like there is no fashion or cool brand that hasn't been built on Instagram in the last 36 months. You think Champion became champion on the back of television commercials? You think Stan Smiths did that on TV? You think LaCroix did that on TV? Please pay attention. Where's Off-White's commercial? What do you think's happening? So I get it because you're in it and you guys are really in it. Everybody in the industry's in it, you're really in it because you're sitting here right now. And so it gets even more dangerous and it's something you have to think about because it's not going to play out. We're not going backwards. Creative is still the most important but creative gets redefined all the time, right? I mean, I built my dad's store on newspaper copy. Let's call it what it is. It's email, it was Google AdWords for sure, but I fucking dominated newspapers. 
I would sit fucking late as shit designing that full page ad in the New York Times and it fucking worked every time because I knew the end consumer better than anybody in the liquor business and I knew and I got really, really good at understanding how to make a piece of newspaper advertising to stop you as you were going through the food section on Wednesday in the New York Times. You know, it was fucking fun. It was creative, it was interesting. Um, And then email and open rates. But making one fucking video and then chopping it up for pre-roll programmatic shit. What are we doing? That's where I'm at. Questions? Yes, sir. What's your name? Harvey. Harvey. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, man. Uh, I make one from digital videos for a living. Love it. Uh, All of our clients, because they're still being sold by these holding companies and bigger agencies, still want a 30 second with a six second cut down. What are you telling people to get them away from that and say, look, this long form stuff, it works. People want to see it when they're engaged with the product. We, what we're telling them is it's wrong and this is what they should do on Facebook. The problem is 89% of the time we can't get them there. This was our big year. We finally started, you know, we got a pinnacle AOR thing. We became Budweiser's AOR thing. We've got some momentum in Mondelez. I think 2019 is gonna be the year Vayner can help the industry because I think we're in a position to do enough work. And then there's also, you know, I'm looking at Jason Hammonds who just went from the Vayner media production side to I bought Pure Wow, a women's publishing company and then last week I launched 137 PM which is a men's publishing and we're doing the branded content work but I think there's a 2.0 version of that Vice refinery, you know, you know, Bleacher Report work and we're gonna be doing that and it's a little bit more agency centric even, you know, even though those companies were good agencies, this is like fucking, we're making agency work. But, and we've already seen something with Proctor, very substantial on the, on the pure wow side. I think this is gonna be, you know, and, and, and honestly, that's what I think my responsibility, back to, oh, so my, my concept is I'm gonna buy brands. Why did I start the agency? Because I'm gonna buy K-Swiss or Mountain Dew or Mug Root Beer or Head & Shoulders. I'm gonna buy brands. The brands are gonna die. They're gonna, when the economy collapses, they're gonna sell them for nothing because they're gonna have to survive. I'm gonna buy them and I'm gonna build Procter & Gamble from the ground up. That's my 30 year mission. That's why I got in. Uh, so, but while they're paying me, I feel an enormous responsibility. It's, I live this bizarre world. I'm desperately trying to get them to do something, yet as they continue to do the stuff I just talked about, it's in my benefit long term because it's why they're gonna die and why I can buy them for cheap. Um, and I do feel a huge responsibility while we're an agency getting paid, I have to give the best advice first. Strategy first, and we do. <laughs> much to what I thought would happen is happening. They're not moving. But Budweiser's credit, we did a bunch of work last year. It all worked. The Jeter stuff, the Harry Carey stuff, all that stuff worked and an anomaly no longer does the above the line work. We do what in essence is then new, the new Budweiser above the line work which is it starts at Facebook and whatever works goes above the line and it's really working <laughs> in sales because people see the Facebook videos. And I don't know what to tell you. Yes. So I feel like it's really hard to get them to trust you on that topic and we discuss that with one of our big like beauty clients and I think they are the worst. So, and it's a nightmare because they don't really, they don't really trust you at all when you tell them, okay, this is what we should do and we have to have a lot of diverse content pieces that speak to different audiences and they're like, but they don't have the numbers yet. Like so with me as a reporter whatsoever, they don't have the numbers. So I find it very, very hard to, yeah, to, let them trust us and then for them it's like there's the VP of marketing if he doesn't do right this year he's gonna be fired it's gonna be another douchebag next year so yep. I find it very hard to build that relationship I agree and be like yeah guys I trust you and do it that way I agree any ideas on how you can no and I, I mean it, I, I, what I think you need to do is two things. One, if I'm you, and this is now per, for you personally, for your life, for you and your kids, not like you need to be on the record so that everybody in this environment knows what your opinions are. The biggest fear I have for you is you yes people to death because you know what's accepted and then six years later people judge you and be like, whoa, I was in four meetings with you, you love TV. Fuck you, got it? So that's dangerous. You need to find a way of not getting fired but still saying your piece so that it's on the record. And number two, you have to, outside of your job, build your skills in this world, otherwise you will be vulnerable, period. And that's it. And so like, you know, that you're exactly right. I mean, when I talk to beauty brands, and we work 
between my Vayner X world, between Vayner Media and the Pure Wow side, we work with everybody. Unilever, Procter, you know, uh, J&J, uh, L'Oreal, Revlon, da 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 da. I, I just, I have the same meeting with all of them in the last 100 days. It was like, do you know how much Kylie Jenner's brand has done direct to consumer in the last 12 months? Does anybody here know how much revenue it's done in the first 12 months? Revenue. How much? That's exactly right, $480 million in sales. From zero, because, and by the way, it is not because she has so many Snapchat and Instagram followers and her posts. It's because they're marketing on social. And it's a brand, and there is the Kardashian, of course, but these are real numbers now. You know how many L'Oreal and Revlon and, and you know, uh, Estee Lauder brands even do that much? Not most. So, you know, I talk, the reason I've been able to break through a little bit, Vayner, is I go to the highest levels and I only talk business. Only business. It's, they're all CFO driven. Has nothing to do with the CMO, it has nothing to do with the CEO. Just fucking math. And I just talk business and the real business is the retailers are taking all their money because they're pouring all their money into trade. They're barely marketing anymore. And when they market, it's not working. Um, and listen, the reason, I don't know where you work or what the exact relationship, but like I sit in these meetings, I've not sat with a traditional creative shop that's playing around here and watched them deviate anything from 30 second spots and the media company, forget about it. They're not gonna let you have any breathing room because all their money's on programmatic and television. They lose money on Facebook. They lose money doing proper P-roll Google. They lose money on influencer. That's going to PRP. They're not gonna do that. Got it? Yeah, and Gary, to that point, to that point, that I think one of the reasons the agencies aren't selling Facebook or Google is because they're the enemy. A hundred thousand percent. Take their lunch. So television's safe. No and profitable. And profitable. Right. You know how fun it is to be a big hold? It's the only advantage a holding company has. Vayner Media has won the digital media business from Chase, from Mondelez, from tons of companies because that's done on merit. That's a skill. You have to plan it, you have to adjust the creative, like it's a skill. A holding company like a WPP and, and a Omnicom, they just use their buying power to get a better rate with CBS and ABC. I can't do that, so that's their advantage. Then they upfront commit and then they force their clients to spend on those platforms regardless if it matters to them or not. It's, it's, it's. And Facebook have got their own creative department, got their own creative people. Yeah, and, so and, and, to, and to your, yeah, but I'll tell you this. The Facebook creative department, I love a lot of those characters, but they're not doing Facebook any favors. They're pushing things for Facebook. They're no different. For example, they tell everybody in here to make sure the logo's shown in the first three seconds because their reporting of brand lift studies is predicated on that. It's the worst thing you can do. Show a person a brand in the first three seconds of a video, they're out. Make a video people actually want to watch, they're in. We made a Dunkin' Donuts video that we got shit on by Facebook, by the client, by the incumbents, by everybody. <laughs> and it fucking dominated because it was a music video and it was fucking funny and people liked it. And then when we retargeted the people that watched two minutes and 12 seconds of it with a coupon, they fucking converted because they fucking were happy with us because we did branding. Go figure. Yes, sir. What's yeah, your name? Stefano. Uh, Stefano. Similar to these questions, I come from an FMCG company <coughs> and sometimes when we evaluate marketing needs or is a media communication structure. They come with some numbers that shows certain type of more traditional media um, pays off a bit better when compared to, like, on the basis of sales and consumer facing. It's because they, they model the MMM yeah. internally to make that happen. My question is, all of these numbers, are they due to this industry propaganda that you just- A hundred percent. Or is it just a turning moment where they are actually still a bit better, but it will turn into one or two years? A hundred percent. The internal MMMs, so this, again, one of the great things that happened to me is I'm a businessman that came into the industry and every time somebody would say something, it, you know, I'll be honest with you, I didn't come in with an opinion about television. I, was, I thought it was gonna be fun to make television commercials and see them be like, oh shit, I made that up. Like, I get it. When I came in, I was like, 
You're, but of course your internal MMM is measuring TV better. You made it that way. Like you made the scale. It's like saying a scale measures your weight. No shit. It didn't measure, like, hey, calories don't matter because the scale measures your weight. Really? Got it? That's what it is, my friends. Like if you're not math nerded out how they do, for example, you know what, what else happens? There's a human element to these MMMs. So for example, when people tell you internal numbers show a better ROAS on TV or these things, do you know that a human being is allowed to come in 99% of the time and say, well, it was, it was too nice outside this weekend and so we should adjust it by a couple percentage points because it wasn't fair on TV because it was sunny and people probably went to the beach. And so like, like you know, for creatives or like, you know, if you don't look, you don't know. If you're not educated, like, so yes, it is propaganda. <laughs> like, everything in this world is built to protect the most profitable things for the holding company. The only way you can get somebody to do something is make them aware of something. So whether you're telling people to go under your shelter because a tornado is coming, or you want them to buy a bandana or a root beer, it's the same game. The only game that matters is attention. It's the only currency that matters. Because without it, you can't say your thing. You're at the mercy. This is what makes me heartbroken for all the beautiful and wonderful creatives in this room and in this place. Nobody's seen your shit. So, to me it's underpriced and overpriced attention. Everything's available. If you have unlimited money, do everything. Because if a billboard's worth $800 but you paid 10,000 for it, well, you're still gonna get some people to see it. But that's not the question at hand. The question at hand is when you have a certain amount of budget, what's underpriced and what's overpriced to allow you to hit the maximum reach. The problem is the industry is based on potential reach, not actual reach. I understand how many GRPs and how many homes could be watching Empire or this playoff game. I'm asking you how many people actually consume the commercial. I know how many times a video shows up in your stream. I'm asking you how many times has somebody watched it. Here's what I know. We penalize things like Facebook and Google where we can actually measure it and we're rewarding platforms that we can't. We've accepted reports from 100 years ago that are vigged, but they're not real. How are you measuring a radio spot? Do you know how print is measured? It's measured on circulation and a multiple of. When you, buy, when you make a print ad for Vogue, you were paying for eight times the amount of Vogues that are printed that that page 98 is gonna be seen by eight times the amount of magazines because the theory was magazines travel and that when you left Vogue on the bus, the next person picked it up and also saw page 99. Eight of them. Meanwhile, in real life, four of the billion people that possibly read that thing ever get to page 99 and actually look at that picture and really consume it. Or you can go on Instagram where every fucking person in the world is living right now and looking at fucking people wearing clothes. It's so fucked that they now charge more for just internet because they need the fake subscription numbers on cable to justify the commercial spends. So they can go in a conference and be like, there's still 39 million people with fuck that haven't cut their cord. No shit. But none of them are watching a fucking commercial. And that's what we're talking about. Listen carefully. Two years ago I was listening very carefully to a lot of the talks. Television isn't dead. You know, the, the, like Breaking Bad. This and they talk about shows, they don't talk about commercials. And now it's over. OTT is gonna win. We all know it. I mean, think about your own, cons- think about, but don't think about your consumptions. Go and talk to 80 year olds. They're on Netflix and Prime, you know? What are, like, what are people doing? Hi. Hi. I'm Raquel. And I was wondering, uh, it's, it's actually quite a technical question. Okay. Social okay. So you know social media and publishing on it, it's, it's always about the timing. Sure. So It's a great question. I think the best way to do it is produce an ungodly amount of content and measure it over a period of time. So Facebook and Instagram aren't gonna tell you that. There was a lot of startups seven, eight years ago that were trying to figure out the time to post perfectly. 
Facebook and Instagram and others have shut down their APIs to really give you that data. If you're a smart publisher, a brand, I, so it's interesting, we're spending a lot of time getting back to Twitter and like volume content. I think that you should just be posting all the time and getting an understanding of your audience and that if you made an aggressive calendar for 90 to 100 days and then analyze the data, you will see patterns. I don't agree with that. I think, I think you should be publishing, for example, let's use Instagram since it's such a player right now. I think m- one man's point of view, the ideal amount of times that a brand should post on Instagram on main feed, not stories, is six. Six in a day? In a day. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Number one, first of all, that's just organic. That's not even what I think you should be doing on paid ads, which is spending all your money on it. Yeah. Like all of it. Like, like you would be stunned how much I think, mo- I think 80% of brands in America should spend more than 60% of their overall budget on Facebook and Instagram. 60. And I'm talking about regardless of the brand. Cause Facebook's so deep now. Um, First of all, you have to understand something. For example, my, my Instagram. I have 3.4 million followers on Instagram, okay? When I post uh, on my views on a video, 200,000 to 500,000, right? And that's what's sharing and people tagging. You're not reaching most of your audience to begin with. So if you're a brand that's posting six times a day, on your most, enth- you have to understand what people don't understand about the algorithm. The algorithm that Instagram and Facebook implement is the most perfect, and I mean perfect, product I've ever seen in marketing, you have to understand why. Their interests align with you. The only thing Facebook and Instagram make money on is you staying on the platform. So all of their, unlike television, unlike radio, unlike print, unlike websites that put banners everywhere, the entire machine is built on you staying. So if you love a brand like Heineken, you'll probably see three of those because you've shown through your actions that you like it. If you follow Adidas and the first seven posts don't tickle your fancy and you don't engage, you'll probably only see one in every 12 over two days of the organic posting. So you can't overwhelm on Facebook and Instagram because Facebook and Instagram is protecting you, unlike email, unlike Twitter, unlike other platforms. Facebook and Instagram is not showing your creative to all your people organically. Of, no. no. They filter them now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Newsfeed's been around for a long time. Even if you're following someone. That's correct. Yeah. Now you can set, yep, I'll be right with you. You can set, like, if it's your best friend or if you're a huge fan of somebody, you can set notifications and you, they can force that and you'll see every one. But it is now filtered and has been for a long time and is why you can do so much more. Now, The bigger conversation for advertisers, this is not now your mom and pop store or you as a person, is you should be running ads. The ads are so underpriced right now that you should be running ads. So if you're Adidas, you should be running ads against Nike fans or against people that are buy athletic shoes or just 18 to 25 that are into hip hop, like a million things you should be buying ads on. For me, building anything, whether it's a personal brand or a brand or, or a PSA or anything of that nature, it's just about value exchange. You know, like, wh- why do I have a lot of followers on Instagram? Because I motivate people and I give them information that helps them with their personal brand and business. That's a value exchange. It's not because I'm super hot. Other people, other people have three million followers because they're super attractive and we like attractive people. Other people are great at sports. We love to see the highlight. Other people are funny. It's value exchange. I want something, you're giving me something. It's human nature. You need to figure out the single best thing that you bring value in, right? And the problem is most people don't like to give their best work away for free. That's what I figured out. I give I give away my all my advice for free. My best advice, the stuff I could sell for $1,000 eBooks and $25,000 masterminds, I give it all away for free because that is the ultimate leverage because I'm bringing the most value and I want the attention because I think attention is the ultimate asset. Got it? And it's an incredible relationship when you hit that crescendo. I'm giving away all my best shit. You're giving me attention which gives me leverage, right? Gives me permission to ask when I have a sneaker out or a book or something, right? I'll convert higher if I gave you a ton of, like people literally buy shit from me because they feel guilty. 
Like people send me emails all the time, like I bought wine from your dad's liquor store because fuck, you know, like you've changed my career and like you, I haven't given you a dollar so I fucking bought some rosé for my grandma. Like you know, like, you know, like if you really can, and the problem is most people don't know how to provide value or let's be honest, let's really get there. Sometimes you just don't have a lot to, you know, I don't know, like it's a, it's a, you know, what's amazing about the new world is anybody can do it. Thus it means it's very competitive. So to break out you have to be like, you have to bring something. But, but you can bring so many different things. Let's say you, you could be just a good listener. Do you know how big of a page you could build right now on Instagram if you're just like, hey, my Instagram is about like listening. Like DM me your problems, I'll just listen. You'd be fucking have 10 million followers tomorrow. People want to, you know, people need that, you know? Yes? So if brand doesn't have an opinion or isn't ready to actually send something, would you rather advise them to shut up instead of going like, hey, it's Father's Day, here's a picture of the You know what's funny? I don't, to your point, I think that's an interesting and smart insight. I, I think that if they don't have anything to say or aren't making great creative, like I think nine years ago, hey, it's Mother Day, worked on Twitter because it was a novel team, we thought it was cool. I don't think that works as well now, but let me tell you this. Boy, would I rather all the brands that are running around here this weekend pay an agency $800 for the copy of that tweet versus the 487,000 for a commercial that's bought on remnant inventory commercial time that not one fucking soul saw. So that's the thing, right? Like we scrutinize the new and we accept the old and they're not even close. 800 bucks, which would be expensive, you should pay five bucks, but agencies, right? 800 bucks to say happy birthday, you know, or like Father's Day, yay, right? Versus spending $500,000 with Wyden and Kennedy and then buying TV time on CBS, fuck you, you know? The perfect thing is what I think we did with Stella Artois yesterday, which is we made two minute, 13 second video for Facebook that made fuckers cry. You know, like, and everybody here would wanna make that video because that's what you do. And that's what we do too. It's just, we needed two minutes and 13 seconds, first of all, to tell the story because the cut down that they now want, it's not gonna be good. First of all, it's not gonna be seen. And second of all, it's not gonna be as good. It took us two minutes and 13 seconds to get you to care about the dad and the girl talking about the dad for the punchline. It takes time to set up. It's like telling a comedian that's awesome at stand-up to consolidate it for 30. You need fucking three, I gotta get you in. It's like this talk. This is a way better talk in an hour than it is in 30 seconds. Like, I gotta get you in. I gotta create the context. That's what's so amazing. And all of you wanna do it. Because so many people in advertising wanted to do film and tell, right? Like, it's a, it's a very similar thing. We now have it, yet we're not doing it. How do you, um, at your agency, get across the issues that we have where we have these large brands and all of these uh, regulations as far as when we're trying to create content, there is um, licensing issues. Sure, underage, um, there's a million different yes, things. Million we different navigate them. Like we don't break, like if there's, you know, if we can't tweet at Roger, if we can't use Roger Federer or Transformers or if, you know, we work on Mondelez's candy, if we can't market at 12 year olds and we work on Diageo and ABI, if we can't market under 21, those are things we just navigate through. Yeah, but I'm in these spaces where we have 15 to 20 people discussing a Facebook post and it's like, oh, one post and it's like, oh my God, can we move on? Because there is so much more to do. Uh, and it's just like this. You're preaching. Yeah. We don't we don't have that scenario. We don't we don't have it as much because we think that that would be the biggest waste of fucking time, especially if it's organic. You know, like if you're you know like to your point, like and I've seen in our building too. Like, why did we have a meeting for 40 minutes on a post that's going to go organic that eight people are going to see? Like, you know, if it's another thing where like we're getting, you know, I mean we did a Budweiser video last year where we dropped a container of beer in the middle of the desert. I mean that was a million dollar production and we spent a million dollars in media. That should be debated. That's money, right? Like, but to your point, I mean like, even on Twitter now where we think there's a lot of fertile ground, I'm going back to the brands right now. I'm like, look, we need to be in the non-approval game can't be in the approval game. You can fire us, but like to spend any time debating if we're jumping into this conversation about Wonder Woman is not gonna, we should be held accountable. We're your partner. We know your rules and your guardrails. If we think we're going close, we may reach out and be like, hey, this is a little snarky, but like spending 45 minutes on a tweet that we're hoping catches fire because we're being culture relevant, waste of time. 
it starts from the top. I'm the CEO of the company and I set that tone for my people and for our clients. You know, like this, the way I'm talking to you is the way I talk to CEOs and CMOs. Like fuck you, you're wrong. And like they can either work with us or not, but like to be half pregnant is a bad idea. This is kind of going off what you were just saying, um, but when you work, or I guess for us as young creatives, yes. when working with older people in the industry. Within your own organization? Yes, who might be more traditional, how do you think is a good it's tough. for us to and, go and you know what I really, really empathize with, with for you guys? A lot of your correct creative, like most senior creative people, she and he wants to come in at the last minute and like and play that card of ego. It's just a subjective ego. Like they're just rolling in at 11:59 and be like, not funny, or you know, like it's just completely subjective. You got to go through. Like I'm pissed that I have to deal with the subjectiveness of the client. You have to go within the subjectiveness of your own organization before you even get to the client. Suck shit. Uh, <laughs> I think the way, I think, yeah, no, I know the industry. I think you try to somehow, one time, set the tone of a very like, dear sir, like do it however you want, but whether it's dear sir or like fuck you lady, like however you do it, you need to be like, but don't you think that's just based on your subjective opinion? Now, he and she is more than welcome to say, and that's why I'm the chief creative officer, and that's what I'm here for, what, you know, and there, listen, that, if you want to know why I hate this place, it's because what I hear a lot of times is like, well, I fucking want a can lion. Like, I fucking think Oscar awards are subjective bullshit. What do you think I think about this stuff? You know, but that is the industry. Now, let me tell you why I'm so passionate for you to go home, start a private label toothpaste business that you buy in China, buy a thousand units, put it on Amazon, and start creating on Instagram and Facebook and try to figure out how to sell it, then you'll become self-contained and then you can do your own shit. Because otherwise, there is no answer. It's based on your culture. I don't know your company. At Vayner, our chief creative officer, Steve Babcock, and the people that work for him know that if I ever hear a whisper of them douching somebody on their opinion, they're in trouble. I've learned that every other organization is the other way. Right, so, but by the way, that also hurts Vayner too because then what's happened in our creative place is that people are scared to give feedback. So we went, you know, like, it, you know, this is human shit, right? That's why my model, what I want for the industry is the best because all 13 of you could have your videos and fo- like, could you imagine a creative world where every idea, do you know how stupid it is for you guys to spend four hours, smart brains, teams, whiteboarding the shit, have 13 ideas, and then it's some senior person's subjective opinion to get them down to two, present to a client, the client in a one hour period, who's really, she's running a business of selling biscuits. She's not a fucking creative. She picks one of the two, and then all of the money goes into one 30 second video that goes on TV that nobody watches. Yeah, I mean, that example is just not fun. Versus what I want, which is you came up with 13 ideas, you look at all the segmentations, back to the genders and the incomes. Like Budweiser means something different to the 24-year-old in Atlanta that loves fucking Gucci Mane like, like, than it does to like 63-year-old Dick who loves rifles and fucking fishing and we can do both now. Like a video of like a grandpa, white grandpa in Bama with his young white grandson fishing and drinking Budweiser targeted properly on Facebook to 63-year-old you know, Bama boy is gonna work. In the same way like the fucking Migos pouring Budweiser and a bunch of dancers in a club is gonna work on 24 year old Jerome. Like I don't understand what people are doing here. So I love the idea of all 14 of your ideas for Kit Kat can see the day of light. No more debating the bullshit internally. Cool, the one thing the senior creative can say, okay these six ideas we're gonna make into 15 second videos, 19 second videos, 47 second videos for Twitter. Here we're gonna do for Facebook. This one is a pre-roll on YouTube based on people that buy Skittles that we're gonna try to convert because they search for Skittles on Google but we're gonna run a pre-roll on YouTube for KitKat being like, and the video's like, you eat Skittles? Fuck that, KitKat. Like, it's so smart, it works. And yet we don't do that. And so, like, what's crazy is that I think a lot of creatives think I'm like not a good guy for creatives because I come from a tech world, they think I'm math, I come and shit on everything and they don't like me and I'm like, listen, I'm the one that's fucking gonna open up the creative world. I'm the one that's actually gonna make it good for all of us. I'm a creative. 
Nick came, you know, Nick's here. He's gonna win a thousand fucking awards tomorrow for his work with Tide. He's at Vayner now. Like, like he works with me for like, he's been here three months or something. And like after the third meeting, he's like, you're, the, you're a creative. I'm like, yeah, but like that's how I got here, right? Like I know I'm not the creative that David Droga is to this industry and I'll say this to David because we're friendly, like I'll outsell David every day of the week. Every day of the week and I will make a video. And I'll make creative and I'll do a pop, I'll do creative but mine's grounded in real life. Yes, we haven't heard from you yet. Yes, great question. You know, to me, one of the things we've done extremely well in a couple of spots. So we do plenty of things that make me want to throw up on myself, but at our best, the reason we started, a 50, we have a 50,000 square foot production facility in Long Island City. The reason we own our own production facility is to drive down the cost of creative. So it can run the gamut. My belief is that copy and very dirty, but nice product, I mean look, guys, you know this, you're not dumb. You don't see your friends or relatives or people on Fiverr, like you may not want to see it exist because it fucks with our world, but you can make some badass shit just on a fucking iPhone, let alone, can, like, like that was another thing. Like I was like, how much do videos cost in advertising? I'm sure when, you know, I, I don't know whenever you decided to be in this industry, but I'm sure the first time you heard, it seemed like a lot of money. Like I don't know, I have a funny feeling if I hired all of you for a ninja team and said, by the way, you have to make $15,000 videos, here's people, you'd make some killer fucking shit. It's plenty of fucking money. I could do all sorts of damage for that amount of money. So we're just driving down cost. I think at its best, I think Twitter's so vibrant right now again that you could do a ton of copy, see what pops, then make the $10,000 version, right? see if it goes, and then make the 150,000, 300,000. That's the way it should be done. Not guessing on some insights work coming into, like you know. You know, that's where I think insight work and having the ability to hack culture matter the most. The, two, the answer to your question in my brain goes into two places. True great insight work, which is not about interviewing three people, but really looking at big data. And big data is amazing, like I hate that word because everybody throws it around, because it's about analyzing big data. You know, big data's real. It's fucking special. It's just an incredible talent to look at all the cultural signals and be like, oh shit, it's about insecurity amongst 50 year old men on Thursday. That, you know, that takes something, right? So big insight work that gives you pillars and then what I call culture hacking, right? When things are happening in culture, you make creative quickly and see if that's a place where your brand can play. So I think it's, it's actually, I think everybody plays in the middle. They go into brainstorming and they're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stand for optimism or, or we're, gonna, we're gonna be utility or we're gonna, we're gonna own St. Patty's Day. I'm more like, no, you gotta go way deeper and be like, this is about moms being, let me give you an example of how I think about insight work. Cause I do a lot of it myself. A lot of parents right now wanna blame social networks for teen suicide. Teen suicide, if you do insight work, has a lot more to do with the fact that parents are so over coddling their t- children in the first eight to nine years of their lives because parents are now so deep in their kids' shit. They know everything. They fucking ninth place trophies. Anybody that gets picked on is a fucking catastrophe. And it's gotten so extreme that by the time a child is nine and has never dealt with any adversity, by the time they start actually dealing with adversity, they're like a zoo animal being put in the wild. That's insight work. That wasn't so, like, we didn't know that was happening, that we had to get there, like, oh shit. So I'll give you another one. I think non-healthy foods are about to explode. Foods with like sugar and like, because in a world where like fucking parents are worried about their kids getting shot in school and heavy political stuff, all of a sudden giving little Ricky a Twix versus some healthy vegan fucking tricked out product doesn't seem like the biggest issue that it did six years ago. And so now I see insights that show me, hmm, this might be the great era for sugar candy and, food and cereal to take a position of, hey, like, and here would be the pillar, however you would creatively manifest it. It would be, hey mom, in this world that we now live in, wouldn't it be nice to just give Ricky a cupcake? It's okay for Ricky, like you had a cupcake, you turned out okay. Like a cupcake would be okay. That's an insight that can really go somewhere that you could really win with a mom that's shopping down the aisle at Albertsons. So deep insight work, and then to that same mom, uh, you know, Modern Family gets canceled and you've got a funny perspective and you've got a good copywriter, bangs in with some sort of tweet, it clicks, and it becomes a whole thing. 
Scandal starts blowing up and you're the wine brand that owns drinking wine during Scandal. You figured it out. Cause you're from Washington State and you fucking took advantage of Kerry Washington being on the show. None of the Washington State wineries did that. They should have. And they should have done it through a lot of copy and then that, that would have got it to that. See where I'm going? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and you have a lot, like you have a strong views and insights. Yes. And so where did you learn those? And did any of them come from mistakes? And if so, like what were those oh, mistakes? The mistakes are the best part. When you're producing, as much, this is D-Rock, he's been filming me for three years. Every day, we put out a vlog, we put out tons of content. The truth is, almost all of it's mistakes. That's the beauty of, that's what's so scary. Why do you think nobody wants to buy into creative for my Silicon Valley world? We could do all this right and you could still spend 300,000 on a video even though it would have cost a million and it would fail. So through experience, you know, what really, and I, I mean, this is not thought out. This, I, got, I got real lucky in my life experiences. For example, this is really weird to bring up the attention thing, back to getting goosebumps. I, as a six-year-old, had six lemonade stands, tricked my friends into standing behind the lemonade stands and I would walk the streets of New Jersey, looking at cars, looking at poles and trees. I mean, I actually forgot about this. During a speech in real time, because you could see I kind of improv it, I remembered that this is what I used to do. I, was, I have such a natural trader of attention that intuitively, as a child, I understood that if I put my lemonade sign on that tree versus that pole, that that would have an effect, in hindsight. I didn't realize that's what I was doing. Baseball card shows. I was a big baseball card dealer when I was 12, making a lot of money. They were big, I'm old at the time. I used to walk the show for three hours and set up my table after everybody else because I would walk it, figure out the current, as I used to call it back then, you know, what was hot, what was happening. And then I would go back to my table and I would walk, God, it's so funny to think about these days. I used to walk it, I used to walk, like make pretend I was like a normal person and be like, what could I put on my table that would stop you? And then the ultimate, and I would tell you, the great thing, you're so young, you could still do this. Literally, work one year at retail and watch your career change, right? I see some of you shaking your head. I used to stand behind the register at my dad's liquor store and I would watch people walk the store. Later, that became why I was so good at UI and UX on the web because I'd already, and these are all things now I'm telling you. I didn't understand I was doing them. Now I can reconcile it. I, wouldn't, I mean, that's how I built my dad's store. It wasn't just marketing, it was, wait a minute, if people are all going this way, because that's how we set up the store, maybe I should put higher profitable items. Why do we have the jug wine there, which is shit? Why don't I put the good wine there? You you know, and just, you know, at the register, why do we have these fucking minis for alcohol, which we make a penny on? Let's put like half bottles of champagne that are like, and people are picking them anyway. And so, the answer is, because all I've ever done is been obsessed about the consumer. For example, when I put out content now, I don't watch other people's content. I don't even really think about my own. I watch how people react to my content. I read every comment. I'm a deep practitioner of consumer behavior and action and that's what makes, what you're seeing what I do, it's so natural. I pitch my full insights and creative in rooms. The whole thing. To the point where like when I started hiring grown up people in agencies, they, after they left they're like no, 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 no. Don't do that. Like, that's what we have to get paid for to present eight weeks later. I'm like, oh shit, okay. You know, like, like, you know, because it comes so, I'm so in tune. Uh, because you, really you'll find this interesting. The word that elevated to me is empathy. I have empathy. A lot of it. It's why I'm a good CEO. It's why I come, it's what, it, I come into this room only trying to bring you value. Like I have empathy, I know what you're, you know, and and that serviced me well as a leader and a salesman and a marketer and I deeply am religious about it. Hi, uh, my name is Josh. Josh, nice to meet you. Pleasure. Uh, I'm curious, are there, who are the people within either the advertising industry or any industry as a whole that you look up to or you learn from and what are the lessons that you learn from? That's a great question. So I don't consume a lot but I'm gra- I gravitate a lot more to Vince McMahon and, and Walt Disney. I love people that can create IP at a character. I think Vince McMahon built an incredible business model around IP. He gets people into characters like Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. They're based on humans and unlike being William Morris or CAA or like a sporting league, 
he owns the IP. It's actually fucking brilliant, right? Like he creates, in theory, superheroes out of humans and the human can't take that IP with them. Like it's really smart and then how he builds up the storylines to get you to care, very interesting to me. Uh, Same with Disney, like I just think that he built an entire universe. So I like people that create IP. It's why I, you know, I don't know much about it but I know enough to say it in here. It's why Leo Burnett in the 70s when they were, in 60s when they were creating the Marlboro Man and Jolly Green Giant and Keebler Elves, I have a lot of respect for that. I would say we just did some work for Bird's Eye or something where we have an avocado Right, like I don't know if that hit your guys' radar. Like I'm trying to push my agency towards, what? Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank of Scotland, you're exactly right. Um, we have two birds for birds, that makes a lot of more sense. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, Royal Bank of Scotland, for our London office, we literally created an avocado character. If we hit, it's forever. And I don't think we're taking those risks in creative anymore. We're trying to make that video that makes you laugh, but we're not building IP. And when you build IP, it's forever. You know, the Trix Rabbit is still here, right? You know, like MetLife pays peanuts a lot of money for Snoopy. You know, Geico, that shit matters. So I'm very, in, that's what I'm inspired by. That's why I want to buy nostalgic brands. That's why I was obsessed with Marvel, the comic book company, when it became a t- movie. And I mean, it was a bankrupt comic book company, bankrupt comic book company, trillion dollar movie company, you know? Pretty cool. I tried to buy animal crackers from Mondelez a couple years ago, prematurely for me, but it was such a good deal because I was gonna make an animated film and I was gonna make America care about the elephant. I was like, if Madagascar and Ice Age matter, I can get every grandparent and older parent to bring their kids to animal crackers because they all grew up with those crackers. Easiest storyline ever. Crackers turn to life. Away we go, right? (laughs) You know? So uh, that's what inspires me. I'm Gloria. Gloria. Um, you talked a lot about doing different content in terms of Twitter, Facebook, video, things like that. Yep. How do you feel about physical installations and, and doing Love. things not digital? Love. Love the physical world. Obsessed. As a matter of fact, Vayner Experience, which is a division we have for Experiential, is one of my favorite projects. My chief heart officer, Claude Silver, is no question the most senior executive besides me. Like, the, like this is real. We like care to know. Otherwise, we should just fire them. Like, like what are we doing here? Like, you know, it, 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 I, I'm so pumped you asked that because I'm so in it. Like I spend an ungodly amount of time on HR. <laughs> I love it, I love it. You know, most people don't want to, especially as a CEO, especially in my status, want to be in the Karen is ruining me business, but I do, I wanna know because it's how we can build, I think I can beat the whole industry by giving a fuck about people because they can't. All the holding companies here can't because they're running financial arbitrage models and every person is just an, a line item. A hundred percent. And I'm trying to build forever. I look at Jason, Nick, Emily, and DRock, and like I only have one KPI. Can I keep them forever? <laughs> and that means a lot of things. Emily's on her fourth different thing in, in, in our organization, right? When Nick came over, there was a side hustle that he had that I knew I had to be very in. I spoke to Bob Memory for, for like an hour the other day to make sure he over delivers for Nick's campaign. Jason's switching now, he pitched me a music concept. I listened. I didn't appease him in that 15 minutes. We might have started a music thing. He decided to go be a top production dog in the publishing arms. And that's just four of them. And I didn't get to D Rock, I like am super close to because we're always together. The reason he's the easiest is he knows me the best of the four of them. So I'm not, I'll be very honest with you, I take him for granted the most because he knows exactly who I am as a human being and I know anybody that knows exactly what I'm up to, I'm safe as fuck. He may want to do other things but he knows better than anybody, right? So, and that's four of them and of the 850, I know fucking a ton of shit about 450 of them and the other 400 are just not giving me the chance yet because they're still cynical because they used to work at Crispin. (laughs) Yes? Like you've always like your gospel is social, is it all gonna continue to be that? Of course not. If, if I entered this universe in 2001, my gospel would have been email and search. Okay. Can't be, the attention's gonna move. Okay. It's why we've gotten so big into voice. It's the first place that I see could be really a powerful land grab. Okay. Um, and social's very, you know, kind of broad, right? To me it's, it's what platform lives on top of the cell phone is what my gospel actually is. The cell phone is the remote control, it is the place. So, and we've also thrown things like YouTube and LinkedIn into social, right? 
Like, the only social network, in my opinion, is Twitter. It's a true social, you know, water cooler. Instagram and Facebook have become content platforms where you push, yes, people can comment, but most brands don't go in there, right? So, you know, LinkedIn, my God, I can't believe how serious we're taking LinkedIn now. I mean, because nobody else is, my content is flooding LinkedIn, and a lot of my B2B world has been built on that. And, and by the way, this is back to context. One thing that I told the team, this is unheard of, I never filter. I'm like, hey guys, I think we have to start beeping my cursing on LinkedIn, I'm exploding. But for so much of that audience, the cursing is really turning them off and I have to respect that. That you're in a different room in LinkedIn than you are on Snapchat and what works for you know, 18 year old Sandra is not playing for 64 year old Joel as much and so I have to be thoughtful of that. And even if it was Sandra, like again, this is, by the way, this is the most interesting thing about these platforms. Same person, different platform, different person. So fascinating for me to watch that. What you're looking for, you, you're in Twitter, What you're gonna react to and convert on, one minute later, you go into YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook and I've gotta give you some version that's slightly different copy-wise. That's why I love copy. Copy is the great underrated thing right now. You make a great piece of creative if you change the copy on all six platforms. You know, I want you to edit the video but I know how much money is involved in that. So just changing the copy on LinkedIn versus Facebook versus Twitter versus Instagram gives you a huge opportunity. And people spend so much time on the actual asset but underestimate how powerful that copy that associates it can be and is. Last question. Who hasn't asked anything? Let's, you, you sir, smart move. Uh, my name is uh, About what my friend? But, uh, company in Morocco specializing in dairy products. Yeah. Keep going. 30% of the company is owned by a dirty, dirty filthy uh, politician for the bad politician to not do the dumb shit in the first place. (laughs) It's a very important point and I'm not joking. That's what I love about the world we now live in. You know, you know, look, I mean, I think, I think the move, if let's say that was my cousin's business and 30% of the company was a partner, I would go on a very heavy campaign alienating the former partner and talking about the product benefits. But the reality is, is like, that's the game we live in. Right? I mean, you look at all, rightfully so, these iconic you know, personalities in the US going down on the Me Too movement, people, you know, people reaching out to me behind channels saying, hey, how do I protect against this? I'm like, you don't. The truth always wins. It took a long time, but Christopher Columbus's brand got affected. You know what I mean? Like, the truth is gonna win. And so, I think what the brand should do for the 70% that are probably good people, I'm like, fuck, they need to, alienate the four, the, the alienate, and they may not want to do that because in real life, they may be best friends. Like, I don't know the dynamics, but what would I do in advice? Alienate, and then go aggressive on the product values that, of why it became the leader in the category. But al- step one is alienate against that individual because you have to stop that bleeding. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, not really a selfie, a stand back. So let's do the same thing we did. Uh, you two are in the class. Can you actually? Get the uh, fuck out of here, guys. Yeah. No offense. Uh, you guys are not young. <laughs> back there, I need you to leave. You're old. Please get. Uh, 